what is the ring about? Uh, that's obviously both a big question and perhaps a, um, an impossible one. But there is a traditional answer, um, and one which was probably best encapsulated by um, Derek Cook in his little fragment of a book, which, of course, um, he was unable to finish, or even finish probably a third of before he died, the book that we know as I Saw the World End. And um, this definition of what the ring is about um, dovetails perfectly, really, with what Simon was talking about today and the Feuerbachian inspiration of the ring. Um, I, I just, as a continuum, a little bit about uh, Feuerbach and the reading of um, um, uh, Schopenhauer being this, this enormous watershed in Wagner's life. I think it's very important for us, to, however, to understand. How many of you have read um, the McGee's book? I forgot what it's called in America. The Tristan Court, uh, no, the later one, the, the Tristan Court. It's called Wagner and the Philosophers in, in, in Britain. Um, and it's a book which is full of really interesting and I think important information. But there's one very, very important thing that I think it's not that he willingly um, misrepresents or distorts, but which I think is almost impossible not to be understood in a, in a misrepresentation or a distortion. And one which I think always needs to be said very, very clearly is that Wagner was a composer and a dramatist and a poet. He was not a philosopher. He did not sit and compare notes with Feuerbach or with Hegel or with Schopenhauer or with anybody. He read their works and in the case of Feuerbach he was sort of part of a general movement. In the case of Schopenhauer I think he it awakened all sorts of, of, of things that he'd been wrestling with in any case. But um, to look for philosophical consistency, to look for uh, uh, to, to, as, a, as a key to reading to the works of art I think is a really big a trap and a mistake and a trap, and leads us into inner contradictions and things. The work of art is the work of art, and it can only be understood ultimately from itself. Um, and, and insofar as understanding Wagner's connection with the philosophers uh, um, can help us understand what the work of art is about, and certainly this is the case of both Feuerbach and Schopenhauer, they're very valuable. But to try to understand the ring as a Feuerbachian document or as a Schopenhauerian document, I think is a doomed enterprise. And one which will lead us, I think sadly, astray. And even confuse us, take us away from the, un the unique experience that is the ring as a work of art. Um, but anyway, going back to the definition, what is the ring about? The classical answer that uh, um, Derek Cook posits in his book, really, is the ring is about the struggle between love and power. Love on the one hand and power on the other. And um, he would have put it, I think, much more um, in a more flowery way. He would say that uh, how can the claims of love, the needs of love, uh, come forth in a world so dominated by power and desire for power in various ways? Now, I think that as far as it goes, this is a very good definition of the ring, just as I think that as far as it goes, and it goes very little because he died, poor man. Derek Cook's book is one of the very best books about the ring. But as my own experience with the ring has changed and undergone a certain evolution, I've started viewing the ring more and more differently, I would say, over the last um, 40 years, since I first discovered it um, when I was 15 years old. Um, and I would have very strongly uh, defended the idea that the ring is about love versus power and uh, indeed to some extent my dissertation is although I would have never come right out and said it in the in the course my dissertation is just a musical analysis of one aspect of the ring um, a lot of which I'll be talking about in a second um, nevertheless um, I basically kind of believe that now I think that that's not it whereas I don't think it's wrong I think that there is a lot that it leaves out <coughs> uh, uh, a very very important aspect that it leaves out. But let's, let's start with this premise of love versus power. Now, there are um, a lot of symbols in the ring that have to do with power. Um, for instance, I guess the very first one that comes to mind could be the ring itself, um, Alberic's ring. Um, and Alberic's ring, of course, I, I don't need to go play it for you right now, but well, I can play it for you. I have my tattoo. <laughs> sort of a definitive, comes in a million different things, but it represents a whole harmonic world 
It has, we have a name for that. And there's lots and lots of music in the ring which is associated with it. It's certainly one of the symbols of power. Another symbol of power in the ring is... Which, of course, is Wotan Spear. Um, a, a different kind of, of, of power. Um, and indeed, um, the difference of these kinds of power is, is a lot of what Das Rheingold is about. Now, Das Rheingold is um, something very um, uh, true, and I think to the point, that Simon said earlier, that in Das Rheingold we really don't like anybody. And I think one of the reasons that we don't like anybody in Das Rheingold is because love, or as um, Derek Cook would have it, the claims of love in Das Rheingold are very weak. Love's presence in Das Rheingold is very weak. And indeed, the character in Das Rheingold, who I often find myself liking the most, if I just took Das Rheingold in, in isolation, I mean, I actually like Wotan in a way, or uh, have an enormous amount of um, identification and, and empathy with Wotan. But that's largely because I know what's going to happen after. But if, if you just could somehow forget that you know what's going to happen after and just look at Rheingold, Wotan is not a very likable figure. And, indeed, if it weren't for his music, if it weren't for the, the, the um, absolutely unambiguous nobility of the Valhalla motive, I think it would be very difficult for us from Rheingold to have a very positive idea about Wotan at all. He does mostly pretty awful things. Um, and even when he does something which is bona fidely um, good, I think we see it um, in a different light then than we will in, in the course of the later action. For instance, when he gives up the ring, which he does do, which, by the way, no one else ever does. No one, except for Brunhilde in dying, ever gives up the ring. But we, don't, we can't recognize the, extraordinary, the extraordinariness of that act at the time because we haven't really seen the ring in action yet. We haven't seen the power that it seems to have over people. Um, and the other great thing that Wotan does in Rheingold is something which is completely passive and only is expressed in the music and expressed in the stage directions, which is he is seized by a great thought. Um, now this, by the way, is another extremely important aspect of the ring and of the story of the ring, and one which actually um, is one of the reasons for the failing, or the, let's say the limitation, of Derek Cook's power versus love scenario. Because the idea behind Wotan's great thought and how it evolves through the ring is one of the absolutely central and crucial aspects of the ring. And one which, by the way, I'm sure very much on purpose, Simon did not bring up in his um, very uh, condensed version of the storyline of, of, of Valkyra. One of the really crucial ideas in Valkyra has to do with the evolution of Wotan's great, uh, great idea. And, yeah, of course. I, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. And Wotan's great idea, of course, it just says, it says, you know, in the score, Wotan has a great idea, and of course we hear a new theme. We hear this theme. Um, which all of us think of as the sword motive, although um, we probably should think of it as Wotan's great idea um, uh, instead, but sword motive is a sort of a more convenient idea. Certainly the sword, at least initially, is the manifestation of Wotan's great idea, or at least it sort of is the embodiment of it. However, it also um, evolves a lot. But going back now to, to the, the claims of love, love in Rheingold, what love do we see in Rheingold? Well, I guess we see a kind of love in the first scene of Rheingold. I mean, um, Albrecht certainly wants to um, make love or have sex with any one of the three Rhine maidens, or maybe all three of them, I guess, if he get his hands on them. Um, it's not, however, I think, a very high, desirable, or laudable um, form of love. And I think it's quite clear that it's one that Wagner doesn't really, he considers it perhaps to be pathetic, but certainly not laudable, certainly not positive. Um, and indeed, um, Albrecht sings no love music, even though the source, and I'll play this later when I, when I really get to the piano, the source of all the love music in the ring, or not, that's a big misstatement, of, of one thread of the love music in the ring does originally arise from one of, what, one of the Rhine Maidens teasing him. Now, the Rhine Maidens' view of love is also extraordinarily limited. Now, they talk this big stuff about only he who renounces love, he who curses love, can, can you know, forge a ring from the Rheingold. Um, but as far as we can see, I mean, they're basically just teases, and very vicious teases at that. Uh, um, 
they, they, they give us no indication, of, at least at this point, of having any understanding of any kind of higher idea of love. Now, um, we do see little bits of love, and we do get little bits of very important love music um, in the relationship between Fricka and Wotan. A relationship, by the way, just I'm, I'm going to go against the grain here, because everybody always trashes the, the current Met Ring, but one aspect of the Met Ring, which is the best I've ever seen, is that it does better job with the relationship of Wotan and, and Fricka than any other ring I've ever seen. Um, I haven't seen every ring, but I've seen a lot of rings. Now, this partly has to do with the fact that Stephanie Blythe is so good, and this is an aspect of Bryn Terfel that's very good, but I think that Lepage has to get some credit for that, too. Um, it's very clear, and it'll be even clearer when we get to Valkyra, that Fricka once loved Wotan, and her motivations for her, her nagging and problem have to do uh, with the fact that she loved him and she feels that he doesn't love her. Now, whether Wotan ever loved Brunhilde or not, I mean, uh, Fricka, excuse me, is, is a more difficult question. Now, but they immediately, are, she's certainly talking about love, and it's all this concentration on love because, of course, Wotan, what she upset about, that he's promised to give away the goddess of love. And that's, I guess, the, the, the crux of what love is about in uh, Rheingold. Love is about this concept of love as embodied by Freya, the goddess of spring and love. Um, the only character I think that we somehow, somehow really kind of like and feel sorry for in Rheingold is indeed Fasold. Because Fasold, in his own very limited way, in a, perhaps not a particularly empathetic or compassionate, if he was empathetic and compassionate, he would know that he's hardly what Freya wants or needs. I mean, he would not be happy with just but basically just dragging her away and taking him to her cave and, make, and doing with her what he wills. But nevertheless, let's not get too romantic about Fasolt here. His idea of love is hardly a high and noble one. Nevertheless, he really seems to be bona fidely in love with her in his own way. And we feel for that. And, and um, he's certainly the only character that really, because even the protectors, even um, Adonar and Fro, who are, are Freya's protectors, seem more into their, her honor and their own honor and picking a fight with the giants whom they hate anyway than actually showing love for their sister. And even, I mean, I guess that Fricka shows some love for Freya. Freya herself, and, 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 and um, the role of Freya as a love object is um, a very central to what we have of Derek Cook's book. Freya is a very interesting figure. Freya, after all, is the goddess of love. And Freya's music is the, the, the progenitor of the biggest body of pure love music in the ring, which we'll get to in just a second. And um, so she's, in that, okay, from that standpoint, a highly important character. But do any of us really have a strong, empathetic or, or relationship with Freya or feel strong feelings? She sings very little. She's usually, you know, has a pretty voice, but not a particularly significant one. She's not anything like a major character. She's a very major force and major, her music is very, very important in the ring, but um, she herself is not a major character. So in the course of Rheingold, we have love talked about a lot in the standpoint of Freya, who's been bartered away. I mean, the whole story revolves around Wotan has foolishly promised Freya's payment, and how is he not going to do it, and the gods are going to die without her, or uh, wither away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the whole storyline of Rheingold kind of revolves around it. But nobody really, except for Fasold in his own very limited kind of way, seems to be really feeling it. We in no sense ever in, in Rheingold participate. There is no love music in Rheingold. What there is in Rheingold is Freya's music. And Freya's music, in its, when she first comes on stage, you know, and that is in two parts, which we all learned when we first learned our motives. There's this, this rising part, which all through the ring, usually in the major, um, very close to a simple arpeggio with that lovely little thing. We hear it all over the place in the ring. We hear it in lots of places in the ring where it doesn't make sense to hear it, where it no longer has anything to do with Freya, and nor, nor does it really have anything to do with um, spring, for instance, uh, right before the forest murmurs. So there's, so there's nature, and, 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 and Siegfried is musing about his mother, and whom he obviously loves in absentia, or loves the idea of. And, and, you know, we hear one of its most beautiful full, uh, well, it's not in that key that time, but it's in this key. But 
we also hear it, for instance, um, in, in very unexpected places. When Hagen, for instance, is, is um, making fun of that was a mosquito, nothing. Um, uh, when Hagen is, uh, that was not an act of love. When, when Hagen is um, taunting, I would think is the right way, um, Gunther and Gutrune for being unmarried, and he, we hear, we hear that also. Um, although the form I just played happens to be from the first act of Valkyra, but it's the, it's the key that it was wrong. But it's the same music. And so this, this form, usually um, this part, the, the, ra the rising part, is associated with more with Freya as a person, if you read it in the books. But it's not. It's, it's, it's just a part of this, this. It might have to do with uh, love in something in nature. But I think actually both parts have to do with love in nature. The, the falling part... That four-note phrase, which is the subject of my dissertation, which I think I did talk about for you guys once here at one time, kind of at length. I'm, it's going to be quite different today. Um, is is um, according to Derek Cook, this usually in the major key, those four notes are the general all-purpose formula of music that stands for love, lovers, and loving in all of Wagner's music, from Defane to tiny bit in Parsifal, just the tiniest bit in Parsifal. There's not very much of that kind of love in Parsifal. And I guess he would say, or I would say in any case, that it's a kind of love because it does grow out of the second half of the Freya motive. Um, it's in the minor there and it's fast. Um, but when we hear it, of course, slow and in the major, we'll hear the great cello solo that some of you already heard and the rest of us are going to hear later tonight which is certainly the moment when Zygmunt and Sieglinde start falling in love. Which is just, the, and she'll sing it later, this is the, 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 the great uh, central love figure in the ring. Now actually we have heard it in other forms in Rheingold, but I don't want to go into that. Um, just sort of very subtly and very um, unimportantly. Um, now, if this figure is about love, then it, re it makes sense that it would really come to the fore, that it may have been suggested, or its sources are in Rheingold. But since Rheingold has very, very little love in it, it would make sense that it should come to the fore in Valkyra, which of all the operas in the ring is very much the most about love and falling in love and lovers. Um, now, there, there's a couple points, however, that I would like to bring out. Now, the act in the ring most about love is certainly the first act of Valkyra. I mean, this is the act, perhaps no, maybe in no place else in all of, of, of literature or theater or music is there ever a single span of an hour where we more vividly um, live the experience of falling in love. I think a, a very, very important aspect, by the way, of Act One of, of, of Valkyra is not so much about loving as it's about falling in love. And it's also about spring. Spring, of course, is also Freya. Sp falling in love in the springtime. And it's about young people falling in love. And it has this, all of the, this connotation, this extremely heady stuff. And indeed, the first act of um, the Valkyra is dominated in a way by this motive um, more perhaps than any other act in the ring is dominated by any other single motive or idea. It, it, it just, just for completion's sake, it actually has two parts as it occurs. I mean, that's the original notes and it's repeated. And then he adds this little chromatic. Everybody remember what chromatic means? I've defined it before, but I'm happy to do it again. Anybody want me to define chromatic? Okay, well, if I play a scale, that's a scale, that's called diatonic. It's in the scale. Those are all diatonic chords because they fit in the scale. If I play the other in-between notes, those in-between notes are chromatic. So there's chromatic notes, melodic notes, but there's also chromatic harmonies. If the harm, instead of going, it goes. The gushy ones, the ones that have lots of sort of, those typically are chromatic ones. Tristan. Think Tristan. Think second act of Parsifal. Um, the ring is, is, is 
Chrom is chromatic sometimes, but the chromatic music in the ring is usually quite different um, um, and not, doesn't have this kind of, I mean, in a way, the, the ring music itself is kind of, sort of, well, kind of chromatic. Um, anyway, but the chromatic thing in this case is, see, those are all notes in B flat major scale or whatever key it's in. But once I go, those are in between notes. And they add, I think we all hear it. It's not because of anybody making up rules, but because we, this is just how we hear that this seems sort of wrapped and, but at the same time rather um, stable. It's not going anywhere, but and the, the, the harmony changes. It goes from this sort of wrapped feeling to something which is perhaps more intense, more dynamic, more moving. So I think that the, the second chromatic part of the uh, of of the, the love music. And, and um, the first part, this is usually considered, or Derek Cook considers, to be sort of the all-purpose love motive in the ring. Um, I'm, I question that, but I didn't question it once. And, but there is some validity to it. It is certainly an uh, a, 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 a all-purpose love motive in the ring, certainly. The second part, this, is more specifically associated with Zygmunt and Sieglinda's love. Although we hear it lots of other places. We hear it sometimes in some a little bit inexplicable places. For instance, we hear it, just to, to throw this out, we'll talk about it when we get next year in Siegfried, um, at the very climactic moment of Wotan's confrontation with um, Erda, one of the absolutely crucial moments in the entire ring, from both, especially from a musical standpoint, this plays. <laughs> Hear the whole thing. But he's not talking about Sigmund and Sieglinda. He's talking about um, uh, Brunhilde and Siegfried, who haven't even laid eyes on each other yet. She's still asleep, and he hadn't even come. That their their love is going to transform the world and turn it into a place of of, of love and compassion, and, and throw out the old old world of power and greed. You know, it's utopian, so it's it takes on some other meaning. Um, I have my own theories as to exactly why Wagner, in very very few special places, uses that. But usually that. Chromatic extension is associated with with Zygmunt and Sieglinda. The, the most after the, the the first two acts of Valkyra with Zyg, with Zygmunt's death, it's basically finished. And every other time we hear it later, mostly it's a reference. When, for instance, Mima sings about Sieglinda's death, perhaps the most moving time of all, we hear that, and he talks about she's. First act of Siegfried when he's, he's he's been forced by Siegfried to tell about about his mother and he talks how she came and she was in horrible pain in childbirth and died. Um, we hear that and of course we hear it in the, in the funeral march when sort of Wagner gives the whole story um, over in in terms. But actually, if we go back and t think about Siegmund and Sieglinda and when they meet. Yes, I think clearly the moment when we hear the big cello solo when things just stop. We hear is the moment when it's clear they've, they're falling in love. Um, and that motive will carry all the way, you know, through the love duet. You know, it's the big, sort of the carrier of, of this burgeoning love they're feeling. But actually, it doesn't start there. It seems to me the first time that we see a real frisson, a real sort of spark between Zygmunt and Sieglinda. It's quite different music. It's Before the big cello solo, it's a gorgeous place. We actually hear it twice. Um, 
little bit later in A major. This is an F major. Anybody remember what happens when we hear this this first time? She offers him water. She brings him, she brings him water. Um, I don't think that they started falling in love yet. Not in the sense of... But something else is happening. Certainly, what has awakened the feeling in them? She's showing compassion for him, isn't she? She's, this is a real act of compassion. What that music is, we, I'll, I'll talk about tomorrow. Or actually, I'll be talking about it today too, but let's leave that alone for now. Um, the source of th that beautiful music. Let me play it one more time. It's a beautiful passage. It's worth playing through. very, very beautiful passage. Now, one of the things that I guess troubled me in this idea of power versus love and the epitome of love being the theme is that the apotheosis of this theme, the apotheosis of this love, is in Act One, and in its tragic conclusion, Act Two of Valkyra. We're not even halfway through the ring yet. So what about the rest of the ring? If this is power versus love, and this is the music, which is the carrier of love in the ring. Then what the hell is the rest of the ring about? I mean, what are we, what, you know, I mean, like, talk about an anticlimax. We've had this great climax of what's supposed to be the crucial uh, uh, dichotomy in the ring of love versus power. Of, 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 and the love is crushed, of course. That's what happens is, is that this lo their love is crushed. Sigmund is killed. I mean, he's, as far as, 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 as he sees it, or as, in a way we see it, he's betrayed. I mean, Votan may be right to do it, or he's right in a way to do it, or he's right within his view of the world to do it. Nevertheless, he's betrayed and he's killed, and their love is finished. Yeah. They have a son, but he's, his music is not based on this. And his son uh, will also fall in love and be killed, too. But th their love is very, very, very uh, tangentially related to this music. We'll talk about that. But um, um, the, the high point of this music, this, this great love music, uh, the great all purpose Wagner love theme, which does occur in Tristan and does occur in Meistersinger and is in all the early operas and things like that, is basically has its heyday in Acts 1 and 2 of Valkyra. So if that's what the ring's about, then the rest of the ring is mighty anticlimactic, it seems to me. And so um, um, I, I don't think it's what the I do think the ring is about, in a way, power versus love, but I also think in an equally important way, maybe even more important way, it's about the evolution of love, the growth of love, the um, transformation of love, um, of the, the love that we saw in Rheingold was an entirely sterile, an entirely symbolic thing. It's in the presence of this character, Freya, and, or, and, and in the, the uh, teasing of the, the Rhine maidens, perhaps. But it's a very, something that exists as a, as a concept, but which is nobody except in a very rudimentary way, fossiled is actually living, or, or, and certainly people may be paying a certain amount of lip service to it, but no, but it is not a world in which this seems to have any great importance. In the world of Act One of Valkyra, it has enormous importance. It has completely overwhelming importance. Now, it gets kind of swept away in Act Two of, of Valkyra, but instead, something else takes its place. Certainly, for instance, none of us, I think, here would uh, question the fact that the final scene of Valkyra, the scene between Wotan and uh, Brunhilde, the farewell scene, is also in its own way a love scene. Absolutely, very much so. And in a different kind of way, both of the scenes between Siegfried and Brunhilde are love scenes. And of course, I guess you'd almost have to say that the immolation scene is a love scene. Now, by the way, this part of the love, this, this love kernel, uh, four note cell, uh, does have an important role in the immolation scene. But only in one early part, the immolation scene is in sections, and only one of the earliest sections. It, and then it's dismissed. It does not, 
it's the second section that has to do with something very, has to do with Valkyra, really. Actually, most of the issues of Valkyra are sort of wrapped up in that section. But that's not the last section of the immolation scene. That's not ultimately what the immolation scene is about. So for the, 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 the rest of my talk today, I think I'd like to start to carry from this and see a little bit um, where, at least within Valkyra, the idea of love is sort of evolving. Um, I think a, a very strong case could be made that um, the two scenes that, that, actually three, three scenes in Act Two of De Valkyra. Act Two of De Valkyra is in many ways perhaps the least popular act in Valkyra and one of the least popular acts in the ring. Uh, when you mention the, 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 the sort of the high, you know, the, the high points, the, the highlights of Valkyra or of the ring, very few people mention Act Two of Valkyra. But I think that um, a very strong case can be made that Valky the Act Two of Valkyra is the greatest act in Valkyra, and one of the greatest acts in the ring. It's long and difficult, perhaps. But it also contains, I think, the th um, three very, very, very important um, aspects of love in, um, in the ring. And as it's sort of both being presented, its background, and as it's going to evolve right until the very last chord of Gunnar Damro or at least until Brunhilde throws herself in the, in the fire, and then actually uh, the, the coda, the orchestral coda, tells the rest of the story. Um, if we go back, the first episode is the scene with Fricka and Wotan, which a scene which I thought was really magnificently done. I, I actually will come out and say the finest performance of any single scene in any Wagner opera, from an all-around uh, standpoint, that I've ever seen was scene one of Valkyra in the current Met Ring. I am by no means a fan of the current Met Ring, by the way, in a lot of respects, especially conducting. But that, I thought, was really, really on a high level. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it or not. Have you? Yes. In the theater? Did you like better? OK. Anyway, I thought there was a, they, they got the, 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 uh, both the, the, the sense of loss and tension and all that well. Um, you know, um, in the great majority of music in the ring, of, of scenes in the ring, are either people, um, either, either, either typical dramatic scenes where the dramatic action is being carried forward by the, the, the given flow of conversations or new arrivals. P somebody says something and somebody says, yes, but that, and then somebody comes on and says, but this, and it carries the action forward. Or um, many, and sometimes rather long scenes in the ring, when people are telling each other or telling us things that, that have already happened. Um, um, certainly, probably, the, the, maybe the longest, and in some ways, the most important and the most problematic one of all of those is in the second act of, of, of Valkyra in, in Wotan's monologue. Um, when Wotan tells Brunhilde the story of his life. Now, we learn a great deal in that story, and, and we learn a lot about Wotan, and we learn a lot of information we didn't know. A little bit of, of what I'm going to come in just a second. But um, that's one of the kinds of things in the ring. And then the other kind are normal dramatic scenes. But there are times in the ring when the action stops, and characters do sing something along the lines of what could be called an aria. Um, at no time in the ring, well, except at the end of Siegfried, is there a time when the action stops and they sing something along the lines of what you call a duet. That is, the, Zig, Zygmunt and Sieglinde never sing a love duet. It's always the give and take. It's always going back and forth. It's not just a question they don't sing together. It's that they're always responding to each other. It's always dynamic, uh, ongoing conversation. But at the end of, of, of Siegfried, it does in a way stop in that. But there are several places in the ring where it's not a question of somebody giving a narration, but somebody really kind of... Um, having almost like with an Italian opera you would call a Shena. Um, let me give uh, the most famous examples, you know, the place in Act 3 of Siegfried when Brunhilde stops the action and there's that, the quote from Siegfried Idol. Sort of, it's like a little aria in the middle of the scene. It's, it's very, it doesn't stop the dramatic action exactly, but it, in, in a way it kind of does. Um, it, 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 the reason it doesn't, the reason it works even within Wagner's a view of the, of, of the music drama is that because we learn important things about the character or about the state of mind of the character or, or you know, it, it does sort of flushes things out. It, it, depth, it gives depth to the dramatic situation. Well, there's a very important one in um, the scene between Wotan and Fricka. Um, uh, Fricka really sort of stops the action and has this really a Shana with its own little tune, which we never hear again, ever, in the whole, just like we never hear this again. 
Anybody think of another time when someone just stops the action and sings a song, that we, the music of which we essentially never hear again? In this case, we do hear it once. Actually, in the case of this, we hear it once again. Just once. This other one, uh, we hear just once again. Anybody think? It's, it's in Valkyra. Exactly. Thank you. Perfect. Vinterstrom. And once again, it's a melody which does not appear other places in the ring. It even doesn't sound like it belongs in the ring, actually. Um, maybe it doesn't, <laughs> almost. And, and um, it, yes, it is heard once or twice, again. But always as a very clear uh, uh, reminiscence of that. And again, it's, it sort of stops, and it, that, that's a very interesting dramatic moment when uh, uh, Zygmunt is talking about spring and love as brother and sister. Um, I, that this, is, this is in my question, so I, won't go, I don't want to go into, into that too far. But um, anyway, it's, it's another example. So um, Fricka, anyway, stops the action, if I ever get to it, and actually, and um, sings her a little bit, her little aria. Was klag ich um er und eid? Why should I complain, uh, wail over uh, a marriage and, and uh, vows and oaths? And you know, she, basically, she's complaining that he's, he doesn't love her anymore. It's pretty simple. There's a lot of stuff going on there. But the, the main thing I just point out is the big tune she sings. Anybody hear anything in that tune? What about... It's the same, right. He sort of incorporated into this tune the, uh, f uh, f f the, the, the basic love cell, f especially very close to the distress of, of, uh, of um, Freya. Now, by the way, this is, Wagner has helped us along this is, he's, because we've just heard it in that form. How does he start this act? We just played it when we started the last meeting. In that same form. So just... We, it's fresh in our ears, as it were. So um, um, we really, I think, Wagner very much wants us to hear that in there. Um, although no guide to the ring or commentary to the ring I've ever seen uh, mentions it. Um, now, its, it's presence there, of course, is, is, is highly significant um, because it certainly changes our, should, change both our views of the nature of the love motive, which we've seen only in the light of these two young teenagers, which they are, uh, you know, f falling in love in springtime in the first act. And here we have this harridan of a middle-aged woman who's a nag and bothering her husband, and we hate her. And certainly, I think part of, us just, part of us does hate her, I mean, on a very superficial and, I think, wrong level. And yet, she also is singing this tune. The same, in a, in a, in a sort of a slightly disguised song. Mm -hmm. You can ask any amount of questions. Yeah. Well, they're both are minor keys. The Frias music is usually, but this, whereas hers is, it's because he's your your ears are good, Lynn. He's actually changed one note. Um, the the basic thing is he's made it more. Here's the, I'm going to use that word again. Chromatically intensified. Um, um, just the same basic outline, but it's there's sort of more juice to it, which is in itself kind of interesting. It is darker. That's a good way of putting it. It's perhaps more intense. And you know, at the very end, he rubs it in. He uh, all through the scene. Now, there's other music in this little Shana, in this little aria she sings. But the very end of it, after the main theme in this in this whole scene is, which is a big scene in the ring and has its own things, which sounds very much like. Anybody know what that is? What did I just play? Say. Beginning of the second act of Tristan, that's right. Same music. <laughs> that's the end of the Shana. Of course, he doesn't end it with a, a complete cadence, a closing, because that wouldn't be Wagner. But he, still, that's, that's as close as it's going to get. It's awfully... F it's very beautiful. It sounds a lot like Italian opera, actually. Um, um, anyway, in other words, I think already after the first act of, of um, this glorious apotheosis of young love and falling in love, it's the first act of Valkyra, in this scene with Fricka, we're, we're seeing uh, love again 
um, in a bitterer, um, uh, I don't know how to put it, darker uh, manifestation, but still one which is very, very much important. Um, this, the next place I'd like to go is in Wotan's monologue. Um, Wotan's monologue is really, really crucial, crucial place in the ring. Um, it's perhaps nobody's favorite part of the ring because it is so dark, and for various reasons. Sometimes we'll actually maybe talk about them. Um, Wagner, um, he needs to have in, the, in this musical structure of the ring, as well, I think, as the dramatic structure, a nexus, a low point, a, a sort of bottom point. What, uh, um, when we listen tomorrow to the second act of, of, of um, Die Valkyra, I, I'd like you to notice how as Wotan's monologue starts after the end of the, fry, the, the scene with Fricka, when Wotan is so shattered, um, how the music sounds like it's going lower and lower and lower, the darker and darker. It just it feels like it can't get any lower. Uh, um, it's almost like a trick of acoustics because, of course, he can only go so low. I'm, I, it really doesn't really work to play it here, but um, it's uh, very, very... Um, very, very noticeable. So, the, and the, you know that long section at the very beginning of Wotan's monologue when it's almost spoken. There's just the, the, the orchestra just playing these long, long, low, low notes, and he's almost like recitative, but not even like recitative because it's not de declamatory enough. It's like somebody talking to himself, which is exactly what he says he's doing. At the very beginning of the scene, when Brunhilde says, "Please, Father, tell me what's wrong with you," we hear this. There's the love. Here comes this, the second part of it. in its own way, this, this bass clarinet solo, with Brunhilde begging her father and him sort of coming to grips when he says, if I now tell it, will I not loosen my will over you, my will over you. The will, we, Photon's will is usually associated with his spear, right? And she says that beautiful answer, to, to your own will speak. I'm, I'm playing, this is I have to confess, special pleading. I'm changing the music slightly to make it clearer what I want. But she says, who am I? Who am I if not Wotan's will? In other words, we repeat that, the, the, that same love thing. So this, this is quite a, this is hardly two young teenagers falling in love in, in the spring here. This is definitely taking on a new sort of tone to it. Now, it's not... It's not major, it doesn't bloom out, it's not crucial, but I think it very, very much colors um, the whole character of the scene, of, of this burgeoning love, but of a different kind of love, between Wotan and Brunhilde. Brunhilde sort of unquestioning allegiance and, and passion, compassion for her father, and his opening recognition of, of her as perhaps a, his better image, as his better mirror self. Um, there's a whole lot of, the one little tiny bit of just sort of kind of information. There's not really a musical um, uh, manifestation that's really clear. Um, when v Wotan um, talks about going down to Erda, he needs to go down to Erda and find more about the end because, he, he, you know, she's shaken by her warning to him. And um, he says um, that he tamed her and got information from her. How did, did we, anybody here remember how he tames her or, or uh, gets information, how he manages to, to get all the information he gets from Erda? Anybody remember what he says? It's very, very significant. Remember, Simon? Do you think he says he uh, moves her with love? Yes, exactly. Very good. That's exactly right. He gets it from love. He gets it out of her from love. I tamed her with the power of love. He doesn't tame her with the power of a spear 
or doesn't tame her with the might of his personality, or he doesn't tame her by, 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 by entreating her with the earnestness of the situation and his need to know. No, he tames her with the power of love. And what does she give him in return? Brunhilde, right. And the, by the way, the argument about the single, which I really shouldn't talk about since one of my questions, is largely comes from that phrase. There's other factors too. He says, she gave me a pledge, you, Brunhilde, and he uses the singular you. So it does, anyway, that's one of the arguments for that pledge. There's one other place in Wotan's monologue where um, the love motive is very, very crucial. And this is one of the really great places in the ring from a lot of standpoints. Actually, there's two places, but I think maybe I'll just play one. One is at the very beginning of Wotan's monologue, when it first... Very complicated, so you won't hear it anymore. But he's singing Tom Puppy. That -da -da. At the, cl the climax of this big, long, very complicated phrase. Lots going on in the phrase, which I'm going to talk about more tomorrow, actually. It was all this stuff um, happening um, before. But the climax of it we hear. And then at the, towards the end of the monologue, actually at a very crucial spot in the monologue, um, when we hear a mirror of this part. And we hear it. Again, this very minor form of it. This, you know, du bist der Lens. Now it's. And actually here, the first time he's just talking about how, how, how utterly wretched he is. Here he's saying, um, the, the, the curse that I fled is not is now is fleeing after me. What I love must I leave. Okay, I must murder him whom I love. Um, so you know he's 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 feeling mightily sorry for himself. And uh, anybody have any idea? We I know we've talked about this before. And if you've read your Derek Cook, you know the answer to this question. But this is such a great place; it's worth repeating. Anybody? Any place we've heard this sequence? He's very slow, and then. First at the beginning of a scene, the other at the end of the scene. Except it's backwards. The other time we hear it, it's the first time it's. And the second time it's. Anybody? Rhine Gold, where? Exactly, and then coming back up from Nibelon. Right. And of course, when he does it in Rhine Gold, it's meaningless to us. I mean, it's very powerful and impressive, but that music doesn't mean anything to us yet. You know, we've, we've heard, you know, like that, but it doesn't, it's not as. Doesn't mean anything. Hearing, you know, that. Of course, in Rheingold, he goes on to. Ta -dee, da -da. He actually continues it. And then, of course, on the way back up, we are, same keys, just reversed. And I mean, this is. Derek Cook makes a very powerful, and I think in this case, utterly convincing case that this is an example. Besides, this is a fantastic um, example of musical form. Musical, musical form is all based on repetition and com uh, comparison. The only way that music ever makes sense to our ears is because we hear one thing and it relates to something we've already heard. It, whether it's the same or different or how it's different and how it's the same, this is, this is how we understand music. Well, this is just from Mary Had a Little Lamb to the Ring of this Nibelung. That's just the way. And having these two places somehow, these two very strong parallel places, just from a musical standpoint, is very you know, um, important. But from a dramatic standpoint, it's really interesting. Because the, the Nibel, the, the Sinn Nibelheim, I guess from most people's standpoint, is sort of the low point of love in the ring. If ever there's a scene in the ring where love is really getting short shrift, first thing, the, the world that Albert has made for himself down there is pretty loveless, pretty terrible. His vision of, of the future of, of the universe is totally without love, totally ruled by, by you know, hatred, violence, greed, just the worst possible things. Um, and Wotan himself, you know, under the guidance of Loga, who's hardly a loving fellow himself, um, are not really, you know, it's, it's a pretty bad scene all the way around. It's a great scene, if you know what I mean. I mean, bad things are happening in a way. Bad things to love, at least. And so this is sort of the mirror. Wotan is really, he's, in other words, he's saying, I am reaping what I sowed. And this great parallelism uh, bring, brings all that, that out. The crucial scene, however, in, in, I think perhaps maybe from um, some standpoints, the greatest scene in the entire ring, 
um, is the enunciation of death scene, the Todes Verkündigung Szene, the scene where um, Brunhilde comes to announce uh, to Zygmunt that he's going to die, uh, um, and that he, you know, the hollow awaits him, and um, instead he convinces her otherwise. And before I talk about this one, this one aspect of the music in this scene and what happens in this scene, and I think this is the crucial scene in the Ring. I, as a matter of fact, I would even go down and say that the entire story of the Ring. As, as this dynamic, both as the dynamic struggle between love and power, but even more as the evolution of love between just this love, first thing is just a symbol and the goddess of Freya, and then young sexual love in springtime as it grows to finally what it will be at the end of Gudrid Amrung. The crucial turning point, the crucial fulcrum is in this scene. Uh, but one thing I was thinking about before is um, how interesting it is that in Valkyrie, we have three very, very big scenes where one character convinces another character to change their mind. The, one, the two characters come in and they both have very strong points of view and one of them convinces the other one to, to give up their point of view and to do something else. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that the confrontations of this sort are exceptionally rare in the ring. Can anybody think of any other scenes in the ring where this happens? Yeah? Well, that's, where, that's, that's in Valkyra. That's absolutely right. That's a very good one. That's right. Wotan is determined that he's just simply going to punish Brunhilde and leave her to her fate, and Brunhilde gets him to change his mind. That's very much one. Anybody else come with another one? Persuading Wotan to give up the ring. And I thought about that. That's a good answer. Um, the, the only, and it's true, that Wotan is not going to give up the ring. She comes, and he gives up the ring. The only thing I would say there is that there's one aspect, a very important aspect, which is different about that scene, which is that... Um, there's no give and take. There's no flow. We don't see Votan struggling with it and then saying, no, I won't, no, I won't, oh, okay, I will, kind of thing. There's no, there's no, in other words, he doesn't say a word. And he says, who are you? And then she says who she is. And then when she's going to leave, he says, stay, I need to know more. And that's it. In other words, and then he gives up the ring. So, yes, she has gotten him to change his mind. So your answer is absolutely correct. But it's different in that there's, it's not a dynamic scene where we see this this, as we do, for instance, in the one that you just mentioned between Brunhilde and Wotan, where we literally can sort of witness how Brunhilde's argument becomes more and more powerful until she wins him over. Or F F Fricka and Wotan at the beginning of this act, where Wotan is determined. He says, I'm going to stand pat. He knows, what she's, he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming. And he says, but I must stand pat. And yet she convinces him. And we watch him change. And actually, one of my questions is, is in each of these scenes, there's an absolute specific point, both dramatically and musically, where their mind is changed. And I'm going to ask you what that point is. You can start thinking about it now. But in any case, all three of these scenes are places where people's mind is changed. But none of them is as important as this one. Can you think of any place later in the ring where there's a confrontation between characters where someone changes someone else's mind? There's one that comes to mind, but I'm not sure it's really the same. Can you think of one? This is kind of a weak one, but when Hagen convinces Brunhilde to allow Hagen to kill Brunhilde. Yeah, but she doesn't ever I really know, object. I know. I, no, that's a, that's a good answer still, but she doesn't ever really object. I mean, she, he just, he, what he does is he pulls her into the plot. Takes, he takes advantage of her rage and her sense of helplessness well, and pulls her. Well, well, she, she says, no, no one can kill him. And yeah, and then she says, but, and, and, but if you stab him in the back, right, but then he never turns his back. I mean, yeah, but anybody else? But, Yeah, I mean, he doesn't persuade him to stand down. He forces him to. He forces him to. That's a, that is, however, an important confrontation, but a, a very different kind of one. Um, but there's one just right after that that would be the one I would think about. I mean, what about, yeah? We have somebody back. I can barely see you back there. Yeah, that was the one I thought of. Yeah, to give up her goddess and, and yeah. Yeah, right. In other words, to be a, become a human and have sex instead of being a goddess and be chaste. It, yeah, I think there though the, oh, there is a difference in that. And that also is true, and, and that's another one where we get when we when we get to Siegfried next year. There, that's an, another place where I think there is a very specific and very significant point, specific point where it takes place in the music. You can't tell with the words there, but the music tells us exactly when Brunhilde, it, when her resistance is swept away. But the difference there is is that the problem there is is it's not so much that he changes her mind but that she recognizes what she really wants. I think that the resistance has been entirely artificial on her part, and her inability to give up who she has been 
as opposed to who she is now. So yes, it's, 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 it is a confrontation, and it is someone who changes, but it's not the same. I absolutely think that Brunhilde comes into the Todes Rekundigungsena, as much as she doesn't want to do it, determined to fulfill her father's orders. She has no inkling, no sense, no, on any level, that she's going to f f uh, flout her father's orders uh, and, 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 and fight for Zygmunt. Nor do I think, for that matter, that Wotan has any inkling that he's going to give in to Fricka, that Fricka's arguments overwhelm him. Um, um, and nor do I think that uh, Wotan has any inkling that he's going to give in to, to Brunhilde. That's more complicated. I think there's other issues involved there, too. But nevertheless, um, I have my own little theory about the, the end of Valkyra. But nevertheless, he does, and, and the way he does it is, is unbelievably important to the, the whole rest of the story of the ring. But uh, especially for Brunhilde, especially in the light of the fact that ultimately the free hero who will um, solve Wotan's dilemma um, is, is actually Brunhilde. Is neither Zygmunt nor Sigmund, but Brunhilde. Um, but um, Wotan doesn't know that then, and maybe never does know it until the very end. I mean, I, when, he, when he knows it is, is perhaps only in, at, the, at the end of the ring. So let's go down to this, this really, really, I think, totally crucial scene of the Todes Verkundigungsena. Now, the main music in the Todes Verkundigungsena, which is what happens in the Todes Verkundigungsena, she comes in and she's, she is obeying her father's will. And the father's will is that, um, in spite of the fact that he loves Zygmunt, or he thinks he loves Zygmunt, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a shallow and incomplete sort of love, obviously, that he nevertheless, because Zygmunt is not who he wants him to be, he is not the free hero, he will destroy him. Kind of a, kind of a pretty shallow love, isn't it? If we want to be really just, really kind of mean to Wotan, like really kind of get down to total brass tacks, what kind of love is that? I mean, I love, I love Wotan, and I have tremendous amounts of, of empathy, and I consider Wotan to be one of the great, great tragic heroes and, and lovable characters. Nevertheless, if you stop to think about it, I mean, especially from, you know, from the outside, yes, he's right, that Fricka is right, that Zygmunt is not the free hero, that Zygmunt, if allowed to go on, will do uh, what he must not do which is as an instrument of Wotan's will, he will go on and, 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 and kill the dragon. Everything in his life has been planned for him to do that. And by doing so, he will violate Wotan's own contracts. So he is not a free hero, and Wotan has to stop him. Okay, but nevertheless, it's, that's, that, Wotan may be right, but that's not love. At least that's not a very mature kind of love. Wotan may think he loves Zygmunt, but that's, not a, that's, that's a pretty shallow kind of love. But that's the only kind of love that, that Brunhilde has understood or at least seen manifest before. And yet, in this scene with Zygmunt, Zygmunt, by his absolutely unwavering love and allegiance to and, and for um, um, Zyg Zyglinda, and then his willingness to kill her and their child when he finds out, because it's in this scene, long before the final scene when she's talking about it, he already, he already knows that she's pregnant. Brunhilde tells him already in this scene that she's pregnant, that in your wild passions you, you've engendered a child, she says. Uh, it's a very crucial moment. Sounds just like Tristan in the music there, actually. Um, the most Tristan, the second most Tristan-esque place in the ring, actually. Um, um, I'll play it for you. It sounds pretty much like it to me. That sounds like the ring. <laughs> Needless to say, that's the love motive. But um, and she says, uh, she, she's what she's saying there is Velzung, madman. Listen to me. Trust your. Give me the, the power of your wife for the sake of the pledge that in rapture she has received from you. In other words, she's pregnant. That's the first time we heard of it, right there. It's very fleeting, but that's clear. In the German, it's completely clear. Um, actually, interesting. Use the same word that that Wotan uses. What, what he got from. Uh, it was Brunhilde from Erda, kind of interesting. Um, but you, can you all hear how much that for a second sounds like Tristan? Kind of interestingly, it's not not significant, but it's I mean it's just interesting. Um, and and he, uh, but he his steadfastness even then finally wins her over. So what what is this? What what the, this is also love after all. Brunhilde is not in love with Zygmunt, not not in the way that Zygmunt is in love with Zyglinda, but she certainly loves Zygmunt. 
And what she loves in Zygmunt and what is, what is raised in her is, of course, it's sort of a transition from a Feuerbachian love, if you want, to a Schopenhauerian one. In other words, it's compassion. She feels really active compassion. But not just compassion, she says, oh, I feel sorry for you. She feels sorry for enough for him that she's willing to let everything else go. Everything else go. To, to, to face the music with your father and take the punishment. And, and indeed, uh, as Eglinda's response to us when she finally realizes what Brunhilde has done and is going to do and is willing to do and um, is, is the source of you know, her, 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 your favorite moment, which of course will become the end of the immolation scene. So if we're talking about the, the, the evolution of love, that's, that's where it's heading. It's heading to that. To a different, to a, a different kind of love. Now, what happens in the music is, is 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 interesting, but that sort of encapsulates the whole thing. And the beginning of it is in this scene. Is the beginning of this? In a way, um, never at any time in the Ring is Brunhilde more truly glorious to me than she is in this scene. Especially as she's fighting, she doesn't want to give in to, Zyg to, to, to Zygmunt, but she can't help it because she has. Now she says to Wotan, and this is a great defense to Wotan. In, the, in, the, in her big confrontation with Wotan to come, she says to Wotan, um, I defended Zygmunt out of love, but who breathed the love for Zygmunt into me and brought it into action was you. It was, now, she may be giving Wotan more credit than he really deserves, but nevertheless, in that, from that standpoint, in a way, that's kind of a redemption of Wotan. And a redemption, even though if he abandons his son and abandons his plan because he doesn't suit his, his, his plans, nevertheless, in, in Brunhilde's eyes, the, that, that whatever you gave to me is what's come to me to do this action and will lead to the whole thing. So in a way, Wotan is the instigator, at least as, as, as Brunhilde. I just wanted to... to um, um, the, most of the music in the Todes for and this in this enunciation saying, is revolved around this new motive that all of us, for some completely inexplicable reason, have been taught as the fate motive. I've never known why it should particularly be the fate motive, but that's the name we've been given for it. I think it's ridiculous, actually. And also, then, this extension of it. See, it ends with another version of the fate just out of curiosity, can anybody tell me another scene in the ring that uses that? A lot, very importantly. The Norn scene, yes, that's right. And I guess there's, you could say, if it has to do with enunciation, the Norns are actually making pronouncements. I don't, I don't know if that's what Wagner had in mind, but I guess that would be some justification for why it's done. Anyway, let's hear what happens, though, in the course of the scene. This is really the crucial place. When he says, I will not give up, um, I will, I'd rather go to hell than, to go to, than give up Zieglinda. And you hear, sorry. First thing that it's in a very it's the first time we've heard it in the scene actually um, a very distorted form and when Br Hilda answers to this it says erschüttert she's she's shocked she's moved it says you so lightly prize everlasting bliss everything to you in the world is this little woman who's faint and careworn. She's helpless, hanging on your arms. You know, she doesn't quite uh, get it yet. And this, in, in Zygmunt's answer, which really starts the dynamic part, the first part of the scene is really kind of Brunhilde making these, him asking these questions and her giving these uh, grand enunciatory answers. You know, who will I see when I go to Valhalla? Will my father be there? Will there be women there? And then he says, and will Zieglinda be there? And she says, no. And he said, well, then I'll go to hell. Literally, and, and 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 then she says, "That's all you care about." And this is his answer: the music. It's 
one of the, and he goes on for a good bit. It's really great, passionate stuff. Um, there's a lot of music going on in there. Where well, there's this, and this constant sort of, you know, these, these up going things. We'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. But that is, all this music has to do with, with Wotan's spear. All this has to do with Wotan's spear. And then, of course, the answers. That's this love thing, which is, in other words, this is all about, this is a struggle between power and love. If we want to talk about the, the Derek Cook scenario, never is clearer than in, 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 in this passage. And, and, and the one that's going to win at the end of the scene is, if we hear the very, very, very last music in this scene, as she goes away, this again. Of course, and it goes back to the, the, the and he's turned back to Sieglinda, so it makes sense that it goes back. But in other words, it ends in, a, in, in sort of a triumph of the, of, of, of the love. I think this, this, if the scene has been a great struggle, great dynamic struggle between power and love and, and death forces, announcing his death, um, the, 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 the victor at least seems to have been love. It's, it's kind of illusory in a way because, of course, he's going to die in about five minutes. But um, still, you know, <laughs> it's, it's still a very powerful scene. It's a powerful scene because of Brunhilde. It makes us feel even worse for Sigmund, I think. Um, I just like to move very quickly, I'm going to make this relatively short. I see people seem to be tired. I've already lost. As, as a performer, losing people is always a very tough thing. So, Are you getting bored? I mean, should I make... Uh, how much longer would, would you... Okay. Did you, everybody hear it? Shall I repeat the question? Or, okay. I'll repeat it for the recording. Okay. The question is, is, is that, is it in the music, or is it, in, is it intrinsic, let's say, that it would be so shattering the death of, of, of Zygmunt? and especially Wotan's part in the death of Zygmunt, or is that something in the Shank production? I think that the, uh, um, the Shank production, as every, almost every production I've seen, including Flem, including some really real losers, Doors, um, um, have all taken from Chirot. Chirot, as far as I know, was the first production to have Wotan be an act. You know, in the stage directions, what happened? First thing, that's a shattering moment because of the music, but also because of um, uh, just the circumstances. And I, I think it's worthwhile repeating why it's so shattering. I mean, we love Zygmunt. We've, we've witnessed him fall in love. He's a hard luck case. Everything has gone wrong. He tells the story of his life. It's been one disaster after another. You know, he, he's, wh wh why, why, you know, something that, that uh, in, in the condensed version of the story that uh, Simon didn't have a, a chance to bring out. But why did he take refuge in this house in the first place? Why is he running? Who's he running away from, and why? Everybody, anybody want to answer? Anybody remember? Why is Sigmund running at the beginning of this? Of, of the beginning of. Uh... Yeah, and why? Why are, why are they chasing him? Yeah, he tries to save save, save the, uh, uh, a woman from an unwanted marriage. Yeah, he, he, he killed. Yeah, he killed the bridegroom. Yeah. Yes, he's running from Hunding's, Hunding's kinsmen. He's from Hunding's kinsmen. But it's the same situation, of course, that Zieglinda's in. When, the, when he tells the story, it's hardly a wonder that Zieglinda should, that should particularly resonate in her. Since he's saying he's, he's running for his life because he took the side of a bride being forced into an to a, uh, uh, unloving marriage and being sold into marriage. And in the desperation of his moment, he actually kills the bridegroom and they're all coming after him. And so he's fl fleeing. And then, of course, he flees into the house where the, the kinsmen who... Uh, who he says, he says, I went to look for revenge. I find it when I get home. You know, that's that's sort of, and Hunding is just is playing his role. But anyway, so we going back to Sigmund. You know, I mean, he's got really this hard luck case. To me, the most terrible moment when Brunhilde is is saying, "You're going to die. Don't you? You've looked at me. You have to die." And he says, "No, I won't die. Who's going to kill me then?" And he says, "Hunding." And he says, "Oh, don't f threaten me with Hunding. I can you know take care of Hunding and 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 and." And he says, I got this sword. See this sword? This sword, you know, it's promised to me. And, and this sword. And she says, she, she says in a, in a loud voice, it says, that, you know, don't forget that poor 
um, Zieglinda is lying there asleep or in a swoon or whatever, and she says, he who gave you the sword now takes it away and takes away its power. It's a horrible moment. It's a terrible moment. And Sigmund, Siegfried, Sigmund says, shame on him. Shame on him who gives me the hope and then takes it away. We feel so embarrassed for Wotan at that moment. It makes it, what? Yeah, and, and, and he really says, he says, shame on him. That's exactly what he says. And, and it's, it's an awful moment. And so, and then, then his hopes are raised again because, you know, Brunhilde says, no, you'll win. You know, and then, and then she shows up at the moment of the fight. She says, triff ihn, Sigmund. Trau dem Schwert. Hit him, Sigmund. Trust the sword. And then, you know, 15 seconds later, his sword is shattered in pieces because, you know, Wotan comes in and, and magically shatters the sword. I mean, in the stage directions, what it says is Wotan comes in on a red light and says, um, in Stücken das Schwert, no, zurück von dem Speer. Then he says to Brunhilde, get away from the spear. To Brunhilde. And he says, in Stücken das Schwert. And the, the sword falls into pieces. Um, because he still has power over the sword. Just like he still has power over Hunding, because, you know, he's going to, he, tell, he tells Hunding, the gay, knea for Flicka, go, kneel before Fricka, and he waves his hand and he drops dead. So Wotan still has power over some things at this point. Um, yeah? When uh, Sigmund's Sig Sig uh, son Siegfried, mm -hmm. uh, he takes the power away from Photon by smashing the spear. Mm -hmm. But is that a payback situation? Don't you? Sure. <laughs> yeah, music is the same, actually. Yeah. Same, oh yeah. Very, very briefly. Yeah, yeah, sure it is. I mean, that's a very complex question. Maybe we can talk about that more when we get to Siegfried next year, but, um, it, but it's certainly a mirror. There, there are two big crucial, you know, for all the fact that, um, this is another point I want to talk about why this is such a shattering moment, too. There's not a lot of fighting in the ring. There's, the scenes of actual fighting are, are relatively short. Um, for instance, um, uh, I guess the first fighting, well, we see a little bit of fighting when they capture Alberich, but the first real violent fighting we see in the ring is Fafner Fof, uh, killing Fazold. Well, that takes like 15 seconds at most. And then uh, the scene, the actual battle between uh, 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 Zygmunt and, and, and Hunding takes almost no time at all. I mean, very little time. It's incredibly short. I mean, they're looking for each other in the fog, and then Zieg uh, Zieglinda says, kill me. She's, a, she's really, by this time, she's almost insane, I think, with, with guilt and fear and, and ray and just everything, overwhelmed. She says, stop, men, kill me first which is uh, pretty irrational, but still. And with the top, with the height, he, Wagner says, with their greatest force, as loud as she can sing it. And, and then uh, they find each other, and just as they find each other, as Brunhilde says, comes in and says, hit him, Zygmunt, trust the spear, trust the sword. And then Wotan comes in and destroys the sword. So in the stage direction, Wotan has destroyed the sword, so Zygmunt is unarmed. So obviously, Hunding kills him unarmed. Chiro had Wotan come up and hold Zygmunt up, and he runs him through, and he runs him through a bunch. As a matter, I was there, now he may have changed that, but when I was there in 76, the audience screamed. Never heard such a sound in my life. Right there over the music at Bayreuth, this is 76 when people still had great decorum at Bayreuth. People were so upset by the staging. But then it became, take, everybody in the world does it. I haven't yet to see a ring since 76 where Wotan doesn't take an active part in the, in the death of Zygmunt. Have you? No. no, they all do it. Yeah, and it's not, it's not in the score. What's in the score is that he breaks the spear. So he's taken an active part because he's disarmed him, short of running away, and would be kind of late to run away. Uh, um, you know, there's nothing for him to do. He's just, he's, all of a sudden his sword is, is gone. Um, but another reason why it's such a terrible moment is, has to do with the dramatic structure of Act Two of Valkyra. Act Two of Valkyra is a very long act, and it's the second longest act in the entire ring. Only the first act of, of Gooder Dammering is longer. And the first act of Gooder Dammering has a tremendous a lot of stuff in it. There's lots and lots of scenes. Whereas actually, um, in terms of dramatic action, you know, there's not a lot of stuff in act. I mean, there's, there's, there's this, there are two big confrontations and one big sort of uh, uh, self-revelation. But, you know, this, that, those are dynamic scenes in their own way, but they're not action. So all of us, it's been very long act. We've been sitting for over an hour and a half and then all of a sudden, crammed into like two minutes, there is this frantic, extremely dramatic, very violent action. And all of a sudden, Zygmunt's dead. It happens so fast. And I think that's another reason why it's so utterly shattering. Because it does happen so incredibly fast. You know, it's also true that, that when Hagen kills uh, Sieg Siegfried, it happens also very, very fast. And that's also pretty shattering. But not as shattering as somehow uh, Zygmunt's death. We don't... Um, 
empathize with Siegfried. Now, whether that's on purpose or whether that's a failure of Wagner's is, is, a, is for a later, later day. I don't think there's, a, there's an easy answer to that question. But the fact is that I think that the overwhelming majority of audiences empathize more deeply and more naturally with Zygmunt than they do with Siegfried and, and feel more just, just completely horror-struck at his death um, than they do at Siegfried. I think that has a lot to do with their roles as the kind of, kind of heroes they are and the kind of tra the, 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 their place in yeah, um, but that's, that's a big, that, that goes with the big, but certainly this is a, 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 a terrible moment. I mean, what we hear in the music there, just, I guess, not to evade your question, is really pretty simple. So simple that I can't find it. Hold on. Here's. He breaks the... <laughs> Rouses up Zieglinda. She picks up the pieces of the of the of the sword and, and 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 runs away. So it's and then there's a little bit of an afterwards. Now there is, um, Votan does have a little bit of time alone with 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 uh, uh, Zygmunt. It's actually even in this part. Votan is is not, is actually not mentioned in the in the stage directions after after he's um, held out his his spear. Um, and broken the sword. Um, but here, after Brunhilde runs away, now he's looking at him. It's very interesting. I mean, this, this is not a question of, of talking about motivic analysis, but just from a straight, as music hits us. You know, this theme, by its very nature, is this sort of solemn and seeming very grand and sort of, uh, it's called the fate theme probably because it's sort of, at least it gives us a sense of something which is outside of us and, and, and bigger than us perhaps. But it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem full of emotion per se. But notice how at this moment, By changing the harmonies, it sounds really sad, really emotional. I mean, like really, like your heart's being scratched. Uh, um, so you know, I mean, this this is Votan's res response to this moment. He's Votan is plenty upset, um, although the way he's going to manifest as being upset is mostly just anger for the next hour and a half, anyway. Okay, I'm almost done, but I do want to talk a little bit still about the evolution of love in Act Three. Um, we've talked about Act Two and this, the crucial Totus Secunda Um Certainly, Act Three. Don't the end of Valkyra, the final scene of Valkyra, is certainly in some ways one of the great triumphant, triumphant in that love triumphs scenes in um, in all of music. I mean, very few places in music do we really feel that love has triumphed over power uh, as completely. Um, as it does at the end of Valkyra. Um, it's not an erotic scene, or not in the usual sense of the word, although I had a big argument with a conductor once who says that Wotan has the hots for Brunhilde, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, but certainly, it's, it is certainly a love scene. Um, and um, I'm going to talk more tomorrow about the, the actual music, but I do want to... Um, the, the, you're saying what you're, to me, the greatest music in, in, in um, Rheingold, in Rheingold, in Valkyra, 
um, the greatest scene for me, if I have to say, would be the Totus Recundicum scene, or the Annunciation scene, the one we just talked about. But the greatest single place in the music is the place, not so much, yes, it's unbelievably thrilling when Wotan changes his mind, and he says, Leib vol du kunis herrliches kind, the beginning of his farewell. But the, but the orchestral interlude, first when he says, but especially the, to me, when he says, um, he says, I'm, I give up my power to one freer than I, the God, and we hear this, this. Climactic moment, she's, Brunhilde says he, she throws her head back again and still embracing Wotan, gazes with deep and solemn, it says, enthusiasm into his eyes. I mean, you know, this is, this is really... And, and actually, I, I think that um, of all the single works in, in the ring, um, Valkyra is the one that has the clear-cut, most clear-cut sense of resolution. That at the end of the piece, of course, we're being have the promise. We're hearing this Siegfried's motive, and at the fire, as Wotan goes away and says, "Only he who fears my spear will go through this." Doesn't fear my spear will go through this fire, and singing it to Siegfried, and it's full of what's to come. But that's that's also, I think, a very important sort of almost theatrical element for Wagner to make us wait for the next story. The next, the next, he does, he has to do that to some extent. But Valkyrie works very well in a way on itself. Um, in a way, better than any of his, 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 his single standing um, works, because it does set up this kind of situation where we have this young love in Act One, this young sexual love linked very closely to spring. The music grows directly out of the motive, which is also associated with spring. Um, then the big fight between love and power, and, and all the, the different kinds of love that we see in Act Two as it starts introducing other sorts of love, like Fricka's love, like Wotan's love for his daughter and, his, and her complete trust in him. Um, and then this big, this huge conflict of compassion winning out in the Totus Recundigusena. And then finally, after the long conflict in, in um, the final scene um, between uh, Wotan and Brunhilde, this great climax. And then afterwards, it's basically just sort of a, a coda, an incredibly glorious, heartbreaking coda, but still a coda. And just, uh, this is clearly this, this motive. It's clearly a love motive. I mean, it's not a love motive. I, um, it was, I'm not going to get into names or anything else, but it's a love motive because that's how we all hear it, right? I mean, you hear it as this incredible expression of this extraordinary bond between father and daughter and his sadness to leave her, but his great hope in her and, and the future and, 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 you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and so, I mean, it's, we do hear it later in the ring quite a few times, and we always hear it kind of as in remembrance of this, of, this, of this place. But, of course, what is this motive? I'm going to talk about how this motive um, um, sort of is worked out all through Die Valkyra. But, of course, this motive, when we first hear it, we hear it the minor. But if I... Of course, it's just the spear motive. It's just the spear motive that he's took, put into the major and took onto himself. So, obviously, um, the, the, the symbol of power, or one of the two big symbols of power in the ring, the 
one being Alberich's ring, the other being Wotan's spear, has been, in the course of Valkyra, transformed in this evolution of the view of love in the ring, which will follow then later in Siegfried and Günther Dämmerung, from um, this um, image of power to an image of love. And it's very, very important also, just as a sort of a foretaste of what's to come, that the love motives that are going to come in the ring later, um, motives like... Or this is the real crucial one. That's the most important love motive between Siegfried and Brunhilde. And all have to do with Wotan's spear. Uh, um, this one also has to do with the other love motive. So it's sort of the crucial tie. The crucial one that actually binds the two ideas of and the Wotan's the, the scale will be that one, actually. But, I mean, I don't want to go into the, the details of it at this point, but it's just that in the course of Valkyra, we've seen this evolution from uh, Wotan's spear um, as this power element and, and this, this nature thing is this basic love into something quite different. As Wotan's spear has been, tr has been transformed, as it, as it were, into a love motive as this different kind of love um, going on to... Um, Obviously, this is also not the final um, love. This is not the end of the story. If it were the end of the story, if it were the end of the conflict between love and power in the Derek Cook sense, I think poor Derek Cook, he died when he, before, when he finished uh, Valkyra. So we really, <laughs> it's kind of hard not to give him short shrift since he never wrote about Siegfried and Gunnar Demmerung. So we really don't know what he was going to say or we can guess. But nevertheless, there is still, the last word is not going to be either with this or with, but with something else. Obviously, it's going to be with, we all know what's going to be with. I mean, we all know that's what's going to, going to be the last word. But that's, that's, but we do, of course, hear that. Um, we've, we've already heard it before as it happens, but we hear it in the third act when um, Zieglinda's great rapturous, you know, um, thanking Brunhilde. He calls it in praise of Brunhilde. It's one of the absolutely rare, rare motives. The one that we all learned is redemption through love. V v Wagner actually names it. He calls it in praise of Brunhilde, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's just Brunhilde. But it is, no, I think he also says it one time in praise of. But nevertheless, or the motive that praises. Um, it's kind of, well, it has its own background, but still, um, um, it's part of the piece of, because I guess if we're just sort of to, to give away a little bit of the plot, as it were, um, we've gone from love is just the symbol, the goddess Freya, and the idea of spring and nature, and, and love is this wonderful young love that burdens up in the first act of Valkyra between uh, these two mortals. Love, as uh, Brunhilde learns it in, in, the, in the Annunciation scene, as she sees it from, from uh, she responds to Zygmunt, and her own compassion awakens. And then the love that she's able to kind of give back to her father and get him to recognize that he loves her. And it doesn't change his view necessarily what he's going to do, but it, it changes him, I think, forever in a very, very important way. Um, and to the, the final action at the end of the ring. Anyway, that's the rest. Yes? I think it's very you play a little bit the spring love scene of the first act. Which... Du bist, du bist der Lenz? Du bist der Lenz. Although du bist mein Lenz would be nice. That's not what she, that's not what she says. That's not what she says, but that would be good. I, I would like that. Well, it's romantic enough as it is. Do I have to play that part? That's not a very easy part to play, especially on this piano. Can I play a later part? What if I, I'll play you my favorite part of the love, my favorite part of the whole love duet. And it only sort of has little bits of the, uh, I mean, well, I could play Du Bist Lenz, I suppose. But. So notice Fry has come back in the other part here. This is just plain old Fry. -a. I love this part.
she's remembering the old man. hard to stop. I, I have to stop someplace. <laughs> The problem with me is that I like playing it so much that anybody, it's, it's never hard to get me to do it. You're welcome. Okay, so I guess it's time for the party. Oh, anybody, oh, well that's, the questions are for Sunday. Please read the questions and answer them on Sunday. Does anybody have any questions? We have a, yes? Yes. Yes, it's all based, it, all of it, entirely, is based on... Yeah, yeah, yes, it's, he's always... Um, there is, well, there are little, little, little hints of other stuff, but it's basically all just on Freya's music. It's just very tender, you know, and, and it's, it's mirrored uh, by Loga. You know, when Loga... The first time we really hear Freya in, in this kind of light is when Loga starts giving his report of what he's seen in the world in Loga's narration. And the Loga's narration begins with... You know, and he says that all through the world, no one, every, no one is willing to give up love, and then, except for this dwarf who did. Who did. Uh, um, so, you know, it's all basically, all the love music, what, what love music there is, 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 is revolved directly around Freya. Um, I mean, um, but it is certainly true. I wonder if we would like F Fossil as much in another context. It's just in the context that the cast of characters in Rheingold are not a particularly likable bunch. Um, you know, I mean, some of us kind of in a funny kind of way like Loga, I guess, because I mean, he's funny and amusing, but he's pretty terrible, actually. I mean, he's awful, cynical, just incredibly cynical, but... Um, the, very realistic. The one thing he's not, very interesting, um, George Bernard Shaw um, accuses him of, of, of being of the lie. Loga is the lie. And, and he has this great sort of political thing that Loga stands for the propaganda organs of the state. Loga is the state's propagandist. But of course that's totally false. Loga never tells any lies at all. He loves to sort of trick people and stuff like that, but he actually gets them to trick themselves. He tells the truth. You know, I mean, he does tell one lie. He tells Albrecht that he's afraid of him, and he, I mean, you know, when he transforms himself, that that's a lie. But but in in you know, he tells the he tells the gods very unpleasant truths, for instance, all the time. Um, just another uh, typical George Bernard Shaw error is, is I think in his in in, in Albrecht. You know, he's, you know, he calls Albrecht uh, um, the the brutal uh, plutarch. Is that the word? Plutocrat, the, the plutocrat, you know, the, the guy who's made lots of money and terrorizes his, his slave-like workers, and that he puts on a, a high hat and a suit to make him look like something civilized, but actually he's this, 
this brutal guy. And, and so he paints this picture of Alberic as somebody who's, you know, the symbol of the Tarnhelm is something that makes him into what he's not. It's a symbol of, his, of, 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 a, of a tall hat and, 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 and nice looking clothes. And, the, and it seems to me that Alberic is a truly horrible and terrifying uh, figure. But Alberic is totally not a hypocrite. He paints Alberic as this great hypocrite. As these, plut as these plutocrats are hypocrites. And Alberic is not a hypocrite. Wotan is sometimes a hypocrite, very much so. But Alberic is not a hypocrite at all. I mean, he comes right out and says exactly what he wants to do. I mean, he never, as far as I can see, ever pretends anything other than what he wants. Even in the very first scene, he doesn't, he doesn't pretend anything to the ride mains either. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons perhaps we do kind of f uh, feel sorry for him in the first scene is he's so unbelievably disingenuous. You know, he, he doesn't, he just comes and says, screw me, let's have sex. You know, it, it's not a very good approach. It doesn't work very well, especially, especially when you're short and ugly, you know. <laughs> I speak from experience. One problem, which is one, one that Simon said himself, is, is that um, um, in, as far as the text of the ring goes, Wagner had written all the text of the ring. And indeed, all, every word of the text of the ring as we hear it, Wagner had, well, not quite every word, but really every word, uh, before he ever read Schopenhauer, you know. Because it's, I think, important, we've, we've all said this a thousand times, but it's important to repeat it perhaps again in this context, is that the only text that Wagner changed was from the immolation scene. And what he did was he changed his original foyer, well, he changed several times. This, and not, not the whole immolation scene, one part of the immolation scene. The, uh, what was... The, the immolation scene as it exists today is in seven parts, the last part being music. And then the original immolation scene was in seven parts, but without the last part being music, or we, there, he hadn't written any music yet. There were seven parts to the immolation scene in the text, and part six, the next to the last part, had many different versions. And the Feuerbachian version, which is printed in the first version of the text of the ring, is the one that he says, not power and might and gold, but love and alone shall triumph, and this and that and the other. Uh, um, and th that he eliminated and wrote a new ending, which is the so-called uh, Schopenhauerian ending, which has the famous line, I saw the world end, which is the title of, of, uh, of Derek Cook's book on the ring, you know, the, the truncated uh, book, unfinished book. Um, and that's always referred to as the Schopenhauerian ending, which Wagner insisted be published in the final text, and which is published in Wagner's final text. But so what, what did Wagner uh, replace it with? Nothing. Nothing. He just eliminated both texts. There is no part. That part is, doesn't exist anymore. Um, and Brunhilde does not talk to us. Brunhilde in the immolation scene talks um, to the vassals and then to Sieg Siegfried's dead body and then to Wotan and then to the Rhine maidens and then to the, the ravens and by means of the ravens to Loga and then finally uh, to, um, uh, to, to Grana. But she doesn't ever talk to us. The music talks to us at the end. But the, the, the part that he eliminated was what, Vota, what Brunhilde was going to tell us. And that, so we don't, it's not that we have a different text, we have no text at all. We just, he just eliminated that. He wrote versions of that, but it, it just, just eliminated uh, that entirely. Um, as far as the view going, you know, Feuerbach himself talks about compassion being, I think, the highest uh, form of love. So I don't think that Feuer, Feuerbach and Schopenhauer, by the way, are really different. I, I think that there was a little bit of special pleading. And there's a very important point that I know that you did say, but needs to be repeated. Is Schopenhauer is far earlier than Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is directly after Kant. He's a direct response to Immanuel Kant and the idea of the noumena and all this stuff. This is, this is, he's writing at the very beginning of the 19th century. Feuerbach is very much a, a post-1830, post-the-revolutions and all this stuff writer, and, and writing in a completely different context context. Feuerbach is someone who very much believes in the power of what we can do. You have to go out there and do things. You have to act. You have to think. And Schopenhauer says doing stuff is absolutely useless. will lead only to further misery and greater misery. Uh, 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 so they're, they're really, really different. But they both do believe that compassion is the highest form of love. They, no, Feuerbach was sort of reaction to Schopenhauer. No, he, I, Feuerbach was unaware of Schopenhauer. I think it's safe to say. By the way, there's one thing I love about Schopenhauer. Excuse me. There's just this is just right in line with you. I'm just one short little ellipsis. Is that Schopenhauer, when he was giving lectures back when he was still teaching, way back in 1818, the most popular philosopher at this point in Germany by far, and philosopher was philosophy was a big deal, was Hegel. And he purposely scheduled his lectures at the same time as Hegel's, so nobody would come. He was lecturing in this big lecture room at, at, at the university in Breslau, I think. Anyway, and there'd be zero people, not one solid, and they'd all be over at Hegel's. And he sort of gloried in this. He sort of gloried in the utter and absolute failure of his lectures. He sort of, Hegel was the other big 
the yeah. Of yeah. Feuerbach's concept of action and Hegel's debate. Very. I, but 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 Feuerbach and Hegel have one thing in common, as far as I'm concerned. They're both utterly unreadable. <laughs> <laughs> whereas, whereas you're absolutely right, Schopenhauer is a good read. Yeah, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche are the two big ones. Yeah, easy to read. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, you were saying something and I didn't. No, 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 actually that's exactly what I can say, that there was sort of really in the, the 1830s and 40s, you do have this sort of um, development of a very materialistic view of the world, a very positivistic view of the world, which is the basis of, of, uh, upon which the Industrial Revolution in, in, in uh, Europe went forward. And then you find sort of the, the reaction to the Industrial Revolution comes in a sort of a, a, a late Romantic culture, of which Wagner was a lot, and then bringing back Schopenhauer, who sort of really began to have a big impact because he denied the sort of onset of modern life, which lots of people in the 19th century were very afraid of. You know, they, they, they went to the big cities and factories and... and the, Industrial Revolution, Industrial yeah. Revolution yeah. was not something that everybody welcomed. What's the, what is the name of Schopenhauer's book of, of aphorisms? Oh, Pal Palagermo and Paralopoulos. Yes, it's just an amazing book. It consists of all these, these incredibly pithy yes. uh, 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 and extraordinarily negative but wonderfully funny. Schopenhauer is quite funny. That picture of him, actually, at the end, he sort of looks like a terribly sort of humorous individual. Yeah. And he was in some way very wry. Yeah. Wagner was very wise never to go. He, Toyed with going to visit him and sort of, and, you know, paying homage at his knees, but I think he was very wise not to do so. Yeah. But but Wagner, um, I think, as far as I know, continued to read and reread Schopenhauer to the end of his life. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what? Yes. Uh, back to the people a bit now. Uh, I don't know if Wagner was wrote about this in that time, but it could be argued. I think Shard is that he was using that as an illustration. Totally. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Wagner's, I think that this no longer interested him very much um, after he read um, um, Schopenhauer or just later, and certainly when he came back to the ring. I mean, one of the most extraordinary things about the ring, one that we say, but I think it's very difficult to get across just how extraordinary it is, is how a text that, that Wagner wrote and a body of music that Wagner had planned and wrote, uh, um, uh, in 1853, in 1852, in 1854, he comes, writes, works on it until 1857, and then leaves it until 1868, basically. And that's not entirely, quite literally true, but almost. And then comes back to it, and doesn't change the text at all, and doesn't change any of the music. He never went back and changed any of the music. He didn't go back to Rhine Gold and rewrite anything. He left it completely alone. Um, but, it, but I think that when Wagner, there still are some areas which he really had changed, um, or I, I, the focus of his interest had changed. Certainly, in, in the original story, and the revolutionary Wagner who had just uh, taken place, uh, you know, taken part in the, the revolution in Dresden, and, and that whole period of revolutionary fervor, 1848, 1849, and Dresden was like the last hurrah of those revolutions, I guess, um, uh, certainly identified the Nibelungs with the oppressed workers of the world. And, and in the original text of The Ring, a, one, a really big deal is made about the, free, the, the freeing of the, of the Nibelungs. The, very, the original text of Siegfried's Tote, at the end, the, uh, Siegfried goes to, uh, you know, the dead Siegfried is resurrected and goes up to reign forever with Wotan in Valhalla. He and Brunhilde, at the end, there's this Gloriana, and they go up to Valhalla, and they, they're going to rule with Wotan forever. There's no destruction of the gods or anything. And, and, but the... But the, the, he, but the uh, uh, the, with, the, with the destruction of the ring, the, Nibel, the, the, the slavery of the, of the Nibelungs is ended, and they become free. And it's the image, it's the image of the human race being freed of the, of the bonds and slavery of the ring, of greed, and of the Industrial Revolution, if you want. Well, then, going back to the, uh, his uh, uh, Albrecht's denial by the Mensch of the Nibelungs, mm -hmm. uh, does, does that mean that is, is he trying to draw an analogy there that the rejection of love is going to bring you something like this? Horror of capitalism and all the well, that entails. Well, yeah, you know, I don't think. I, yes, I mean that 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 is that is a reading which is often given that um, Alberic is draw, is driven to do what he does because his his love has been rejected. I personally don't buy it um, for, for kind of a lot of reasons, um, but the main reason is this: is that the kind of love, what kind of love is Alberic? 
offering the right names. He basically just wants to, you know, I mean, he, I mean yeah, I mean, he, he's, it's not, he's not in love with the ride maidens. They're pretty and they're young and he's horny. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, um, and as soon, and, and as soon as they say, talk, you can get a, a, a ring of power you can get, I think he's immediately interested. Uh, he's immediately interested. You know, there's this big and very understandable. This is the, Wagner is, and that, uh, we may part uh, paths here a little bit, but I think Wagner is hoisted by his own petard because one of the great triumphs of Wagner as, as a dramatic um, writer and composer is his ability and his desire, really, his ability and, uh, to fulfill this desire to flesh out his villains. Um, um, in, in flesh out all of his characters. One of the main reasons why Wagner develops the leitmotiv system is to give people, the characters, and their actions depth and backgrounds and past. And people are who they are because of things that have happened to them. And certainly, Alberich is to some extent who he is because he's been rejected. But Alberich already, as we first see him, is, is, is not a very nice... I mean, Alberich is very unpleasant bill of goods from the start. He's not some wonderful guy who's been wounded by life. Maybe we don't know this, but if it's happened, it's happened before we've seen him. And, and, and then in his the utmost despair, renounces love and, 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 and gets this view of... No, I mean, I think, he's a, I think he's a pretty unpleasant bill of goods. But with, what, what mainly what Alberich becomes is he's very real. You know, um, I think it's interesting to compare Alberich, this is going to get us very far afield here, but why not, um, with um, other, the great villains of literature. Um, and one really great villain of literature, uh, at least, and one in a, in a work that's very often compared, especially recently, to The Ring, is Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings. And you have the great villains, Sauron. Now, see, now, Tol Tolkien wants to have a great villain, but he wants him to be just a great villain. And so he actually has a very uh, successful, he, we never see him. He never, we, he's, there's a couple places where he sort of, sort of by te telepathy communicates to people, but we never see him. He's sort of this eye someplace. But, and, and that's the, because he's completely just evil. He's just completely evil. Uh, Tolkien is a Christian writer and has this Christian view of evil as something sort of, Wagner is, 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 is not, not in the same kind of way at least. And so Wagner is very intent on uh, creating in, in his villains, in Alberich and Hagen and everything, very well-rounded, fleshed-out people um, who seem very real. But, um, um, but because of that, I think that sometimes um, directors, in particular, um, sort of fall in love with their reality and turn them into very likable, nice people. And, sort of, and, and you know, poor, poor, un, just misunderstood um, Alberich, you know, he's really the nice guy. I mean, I've seen many rings where Alberich is much more likable than Wotan. And this is simply not Wagner's intention. And it's, it's so, what it, the main thing, it, it so drastically betrays the music. The relationship between Wotan and Alberich is absolutely ironcladly set forth in the music. They have, and Wagner, yes, they are very similar. There's tons of similarities. Alberich goes down to the Rhine and steals the Rhine gold and darkens the Rhine and corrupts what was once uh, pure. Wotan goes down to the Norns and drinks from the wells of wisdom and tears out a branch of the world ash tree and makes the spear of it and the world ash, and the, and the wells of wisdom dry up and the world ash tree starts to die. Certainly there are big parallels. Wotan himself calls himself Light Alberich in the scene with Mima. Now, but there are huge differences too. Don't hear Alberich calling himself a dark Wotan, do you? No, he doesn't. Alberich doesn't see any of the irony of the situation. Albrecht is completely just blinded by his hatred and rage and greed. And their music is similar. And the main theme of Albrecht, Albrecht doesn't have a theme, by the way, interesting. And neither does, either Albrecht nor Wotan has a theme. But certainly, Albrecht is mostly identified with this. And Wotan is mostly identified with... And that grows direct, they grow the, the whole, that wonderful transition between scene one and scene two of, of, of Rheingold, where Wotan transforms, and then it becomes, and then, and then, and then, he dresses it up. So Wotan, Wagner is making it very clear that yes, Wotan and Albrecht are parallels, but at the same time, this, however flawed it is, is noble, majestic, great, glorious music. And this is sinister. And it is. Th those aren't things that I'm saying that we can just say, you can lay interpretation through. We hear them and we, we respond to them emotionally. Wotan, in spite of his flaws, 
is, this is, you know, shades of meaning. Wotan and, 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 and the stage director is very correct and I, to bring out the parallels between Wotan and Alberich. And, and to show how they, they fall into same traps, but they're also profoundly different beings with profoundly different motivations. I think he thinks he's he... the goal to get him the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And Botan goes down and, and then he turns the table. Botan and with his psychic load go down uh, mm -hmm. and, and they, get, they get it all back by again by... Oh, I'm not, sure, I'm not defending what Votan does when he's... Still, although, the fact of the matter is, if Votan had gone down, stolen the ring from Al Albrecht, Albrecht says to Votan, I'm going to, just as I don't love, if I have renounced love, every being in the world will renounce love. Just as I live by greed and hatred, only greed and hatred will reign in this world. He gives an absolutely clear-cut, unmitigated view of the worst possible vision of the world, which is very far from Votan's, even at his worst. So if Wotan had gone down there, seized the ring from Alberich, and given it back to the Rhine Maidens, Wotan would be a hero. Nobody could blame The moral, the problem of Wotan's action is not that he goes down and steals and, 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 and seizes the ring from Alberich. Alberich, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like shooting the guy at the tower at the University of Texas who's taking pot shots at everybody. It's, it's, it's unfortunate to shoot somebody, but it's better than having him sit there and still shoot everybody else, right? I mean, Albrecht, Albrecht has, is clearly has the worst possible plan for, 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 for the world that anybody could have. And I think that from a moral standpoint, Wotan is, is clearly justified. The problem is he abrogates the immorality because his intent is to keep the ring. Oh, his intent, I suppose, is to, to ransom Freya, but as soon as he has the ring, he's never going to... He he's not about to give it up until Erda scares him out of it. But then he does give it up. And that, of course, is in itself. I, I even said that at the beginning of the talk today, that nobody else does, including Brunhilde. You know, we all love Brunhilde for good reason. I mean, she's the hero of the ring, after all. But nevertheless, she has every reason to give up the ring herself, and she won't do it. <laughs> you know, she's as much slave to it as anybody else. She, it means something else to her, obviously, but still... Her love for, for Siegfried, you know, would be exactly the same whether or not she was carrying his ring on his finger. If he'd come back and say, well, oh, what happened to that ring I gave you? And he said, oh, you know, I had to give it up because it was the, the whole fate of the world depended upon it. I don't think he would have, I don't think he would have cared. <laughs> but you know, there's a, the, the, the other issue about the difference in similarity between Albrecht and Bertrand is that the very telling moment in scene four of the Professor Angle, when sort of, uh, Albrecht sort of, becomes quite intelligent and almost has to explain himself in a way that's a little bit embarrassing because he shouldn't be able to explain himself. He said, look, what I've done 